equitable relationship with plants. We rely on them. We need them. And things like climate change, pesticide use, food security, water pollinators, uh, depression rates. Everybody knows you touch soil. It's good for your immune system. It's good for your mental health. It's good for your emotional health. It is alarming that there are people in the world that may have not ever touched soil or plants other than possibly food that are grown with pesticides. Um, that is a tremendous biological shift for our species to have never touched soil. That is a tremendous immunological disadvantage. We need soil. We need plants. And if we care about increasing rates of endangered species, we care about plants, right? This is, wildlife cannot survive without indigenous plants. It is interesting to me that very often we talk about indigenous rights, people. We also need to be talking about indigenous plants, native plants. Rachel, Hi. are you here for the talk? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, my husband, son, and I, we have a native plant nursery. <coughs> We're located about an hour and a half north of here in northwestern New Jersey along the Delaware River. Um, for those of you who are gardeners, and it sounds like many of you are, I have gardened on clay soil, swamp, like clay, swamp, wet. And now I live up in the Highlands region of New Jersey where my soil is very well drained and very rocky. So I've kind of gardened on it all. What I am personally most interested in is actually natural wild lands, uh, which interestingly have all, even though they are very wild, have at one point probably been tended by indigenous people. So that's what we're doing here. These are wild plants, but the, these are not tamed, they're not domesticates, they are grown from seed that my husband and I wild collect. This is one of our native rose species. You will notice it looks a lot different than grandma's roses, or maybe the roses that are planted outside your apartment, or the roses that you walk by, or uh, the roses that maybe one day someone gave you, uh, you know, one of those bright red roses at uh, for a holiday or anniversary or something like that. So if you imagine in your mind that dark red rose that's supposed to symbolize love and romance, there's plenty of room over here too if anybody wants to come in. With all those many petals, well, the rosaceae family, which is a very large family, the rose family includes strawberries, roses, apples, they all have five petals, and you imagine those red roses. That red rose has far more than five petals, right? It does. So what happened to that rose? Why is it so different than this Virginia rose that grows in the wild on top of um, dry ridge tops? What makes it so different? Well, it's been domesticated. It's been cultivated. It's experienced um, possibly uh, different seed collecting methods, different propagation methods to make it have more petals than five, which it would naturally occur with. How does that happen? It's not magic. It's at the expense of something. And what is that something? Well, the sexual parts of the plant. The pollen producing parts, the nectar producing parts, and so therefore, if it doesn't have pollen, and if it doesn't have pollen, then it probably doesn't have the female parts either, which is the ovary, which creates a seed. So it's not gonna have seeds, it's not gonna have fruit or nuts. So um, basically that plant is inert. It is asexual, it cannot reproduce. It is not producing, it's basically the same thing as putting a square of astroturf in your front yard and expecting it to support pollinators. It 
doesn't have anything for pollinators. It never will, it'll never have fruit. It's completely inert. And interestingly enough, AstroTurf was developed by Monsanto. I just learned that. Um, so when we plant these plants that have not been domesticated, they still have pollen, they still have nectar, and they still produce fruit, which is what, if we are interested in permaculture, and I'll talk about that in a moment, if we're interested in growing wild plants or even domesticated plants for fruit, we want them to be sexual. We want them to have all those things so they can produce the fruit that we need. At first it was just knowing the plants, knowing something new, knowing something fresh, knowing something different. And then over time we became interested in the traditional uses of these plants, edible, medicinal, craft, cultural uses of these plants. I took a variety of classes and it wasn't until I took a year long apprenticeship about seven or eight years ago in herbal medicine that I it kind of unlocked the plants for me. I went from kind of dabbling in edible and medicinal plants to really using them as a primary mode in our healthcare practice and also um, adding them more and more to our food as a household. Different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities different mentality today. It, it, it seems hard. hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say it's hard because the only thing hard, hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. Is a challenge. Um, so, so I'm ready. I'm ready for this challenge. And I was built for this.